area risk in Mozambique. Um, Kelly is also a co-investigator on a new NIEHS, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Science um, R01 grant that Tracy Kugler and uh, Kat Grace are MPIs on. Um, and so that's an exciting new grant that was just funded. Uh, and I want to present Kelly with our coveted MPC mug, which you can only get by presenting in this uh, seminar series. So welcome, Kelly. We look forward to your talk. Hi. So everyone should be able to hear me. Um, I tend to speak and project pretty well, even without a microphone. Um, I'm going to move it down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is. You got it. Good. Better. Good. Perfect. All right. All right. So this is going to be a really fun talk because most of this stuff that I'm going to present is fairly new, and some of it is just launching. Um, but it's really all around kind of climate change. And malaria risk, kind of what's been done, how it's been looked at before. But when we think about it from an epidemiologic perspective, how can we actually measure this? How do we measure the impacts of climate change directly? How can we create models to use that data? And then, you're good. <laughs> and then, how can we actually inform uh, policy? Good. Okay. And so climate change has been really kind of up and coming and on the forefront of people's minds, um, particularly in terms of the health impacts. And a lot more recently, we're really linking these ideas together. How does climate change impact our health? And so the Lancet has been putting out yearly annual reports about the impact of climate change and what, what uh, the impact of climate change generally, and then what are the actual health impacts. From 2022, they really focused on fossil fuel consumption but they also track kind of trends in how we're looking at climate change and how we're looking at it in terms of our health. And so they actually look at it from different angles, right? So in this graph, they're showing kind of trends in um, uh, the proportion of countries that refer to climate change and health at um, UN assembly meetings. So thinking about it really on that high level policy, how many countries are actually talking about this when they're getting together to you know, discuss important issues. And you can see here, climate change, they've been talking about it basically over the past 20 years. So it's still recent, but over the past 20 years, they have been bringing up climate change as an important international issue. Uh, surprisingly, you know, historically, health wasn't really a huge international issue, but it's been on in the uptick. Um, this big surge kind of in 2020 was most likely related to the pandemic. But more recently, over the past 10 years, there's been a lot more discussion about that intersection between climate change and health, rather than kind of thinking about them independently, thinking about how they're interacting with each other. What are the health impacts of climate change? Um, when tracked by kind of media publications, newspaper uh, publications, you don't see that dra dramatic rise, right? So what's being talked about kind of day to day, um, we have seen some increase in uh, articles about climate change, um, but not so much in terms of broad scale media attention on the impacts of health and climate change. But scientifically, we've been looking at kind of the impacts of climate change for a while, right? There's been a huge uptick, um, but it's there. We're looking at the impacts of climate change. However, what we are still trying to understand really is how do we adapt to this? We know that there are impacts. We're experiencing those impacts, but how do we adapt to that? And how do we actually mitigate these impacts? We are seeing an increase in interest in that, but it's just kind of coming up now rather than showing, yes, climate change is having these impacts, but what do we do about it? How do we actually um, change our policies to address this? And how do we address the health issues as well? And so I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. So I think about climate change and infectious diseases. I also study vector-borne diseases, so I think about it in terms of the life cycle of the vectors. So when in the Lancer report, they focused on a few specific infectious diseases that are predicted to be directly impacted by climate change. 
So at the bottom, they're looking at uh, Vibrio, all Vibrio, and then Vibrio cholera. And it's really interesting when you think about it because they actually uh, look at uh, the suitability of the environment for transmission, and they divide this up by um, development index of the country because you know we know that the economy of the country is very predictive of how well infectious diseases will spread in those areas. But they also looked at Vibrio by different um, environmental areas because different environments have different suitabilities for specific infectious diseases. Um, but I'm not really interested in cholera or Vibrio from this perspective. Uh, I'm more interested in the mosquito-borne diseases, specifically malaria. And what's interesting about this, if I move out front, will the camera still be able to track me? Okay, cool. I don't, I get a little, a little like restricted behind the podium and I like move around. Um, okay, so with malaria, what's interesting is that you can see over time, this is looking at the average number of months suitable, right? So they're usually where areas that have malaria um, will have a transmission season. And so this is looking at in terms of the impact on the extension of that transmission season. And they divide it up by um, development index as well. and. Uh, malaria is a disease of poverty. So lower development indices, countries with lower development um, are more likely to be endemic for malaria. So you can see the low and medium countries uh, are at the top, but it's not really predicted to have that much of a large increase, right? So maybe a month longer transmission season. Um, and we're gonna kind of talk about that as we go on. Um, I'm not gonna talk about dengue, but I will say, in terms of if you follow, if you follow dengue, um, dengue is kind of like that bellwether of what we're seeing in terms of this is an actual real live impact of climate change. Uh, it's spread by um, 80s mosquitoes, and they are invasive, and they are now everywhere. So they used to have specific geographic areas where they would live, and they can transmit multiple different um, viruses. But they've spread all over the globe. And they are really, really efficient vectors of infectious diseases. And it is predicted, we're seeing dengue in places now that are not endemic for dengue. And it's predicted to continue to spread in, until basically dengue is going to be pretty much everywhere in months where these mosquitoes are able to actually flourish. Okay, so back to malaria. So um, in terms of malaria, if you don't know anything about malaria, um, this is showing its life cycle. It's a vector-borne disease. It's a parasitic disease, and it has a very, very complex life cycle. But it also has a life cycle with many different stages to have interventions and target those interventions. But really, it hinges upon mosquitoes, right? Mosquitoes are the vector that spread it, and it's how the, the parasite actually develops within the mosquito within its own cycle right, in, oh, in order for it to be transmitted. So I'm not gonna go through all the stages, but I really wanna highlight that the mosquito is really important and um, that there's a specific cycle of the parasite that needs the mosquito in order for it to actually complete its transmission cycle. And because it's a vector-borne disease and it's mosquito-driven, we know that mosquitoes like specific types of weather. And so it's also very environmentally driven. And so when you have a mosquito, the mosquito's behavior, the mosquito's probability of survival day to day, and the probability of propagating more mosquitoes is all driven by the environment because they need bodies of water and they need specific temperature ranges in order to lay their eggs and for those eggs to hatch, right? And so for a mosquito's life, its entire life cycle, particularly uh, adult female mosquitoes, is driven by the ability to take a blood meal, and they need that in order to lay their eggs. So they basically emerge out of the water as adults, they uh, swarm, they mate, then they start feeding. Their first blood meal is their first opportunity to become infected with malaria parasites. And then every blood meal afterwards is their opportunity to spread those parasites. And so if we think about the life cycle of the mosquito, we know that it's very much environmentally driven, its ability to lay eggs and then emerge, creating more mosquitoes and feed on people is very environmentally driven. But what's interesting about malaria is also the parasite side 
is temperature driven. So this is showing the, the sporagonic cycle, right? That's the development of parasites within the mosquito and the number of days until they develop and can be then transmitted on, right? And so the parasite itself, because it lives in that tiny mosquito and that mosquito is outdoors, the parasite is really dependent upon the ambient temperature. And so this is just different models, right? But it's showing that as you increase the temperature, even in ranges of, of five degrees, you decrease the time that it takes for parasite to develop within the mosquito. So if temperatures rise slightly, you get faster reproduction of the parasites in the mosquito, and so they can actually be transmitted quicker. And if you think about, well, the parasites are, they're um, reproducing faster, so they can develop and be transmitted faster within the actual mosquito side too, this is looking at the gonotrophic duration. So the number of days that it takes for those mosquito eggs to emerge, so to hatch and emerge, you can see that again, it's incredibly temperature dependent. So it's specific temperatures. If you have slight increases in temperatures, you decrease that time period, right? So you have more eggs that can hatch faster. And within these slightly higher temperatures, you have parasites that are developing quicker. So you have more parasites and you actually end up with more mosquitoes. And when we're talking about adult mosquitoes, right, there's more at increased temperatures, you can have more mosquitoes hatching. Um, and I'm just gonna focus here because I know there's a lot of different graphs on here, but this is the proportion survivor. So the survivorship of adult mosquitoes day to day, when you get into kind of those 20 to 25 degree uh, temperatures, you have the highest adult survival. So those adult mosquitoes can feed more, right? They're more likely to live longer, even if it's days, and they're more likely to take more blood meals, more likely to have opportunities to acquire and transmit parasites. What is interesting though, is once you get into really high temperatures, this drops off pretty rapidly, right? And so there is this bit of uncertainty that we know that exists if temperatures go too high, you're gonna kill mosquitoes. But if they go right into that good range, you can have expansion of mosquitoes that can transmit malaria and can, can transmit it more efficiently. Okay. And these relationships focusing on the mosquito and the temperature and a little bit of the humidity and precipitation is where most of the work around the impacts of climate change and potential impacts of climate change on malaria have been centered. Right, and modeling out what could happen if global temperatures shift slightly one direction or slightly in the other direction in terms of the global distribution of malaria. And it gets a little bit um, difficult here. It gets a little bit muddy, right? Because when they run these models, they're really focusing on those slight temperature changes. They're modeling out mosquitoes and they're making a lot of assumptions about how many mosquitoes live in the world, how well they can breed, where they all are, and things that we don't actually have like data on, right? And they model out really far into the future because we know that climate change is a long-term process. And so when they do these, these, they run different scenarios of what could happen. And for this paper, what they did was they showed kind of globally at the really large scale, what areas potentially could have, so the, the color scheme is, could have an increased number of months, so change in months of a suitable malaria transmission season. So that's areas in the, the reds, the warmer colors. And what which areas may actually get to that point where it's too hot, where they actually will have a shorter transmission season because the mosquitoes aren't gonna be able to survive at higher temperatures. And so you can see, I'll point out this one, this their last, um, oh, sorry. Okay, the last map, because this is the one that shows the most drastic change where you can see clearly that some areas in South America will literally be too hot to support mosquitoes, right? A lot of the areas around the equator will get too hot. And so there may be decreases in the transmission season. And then other areas are going to get um, increases in the length of their transmission season, right? And this is actually pretty cool. And they do a really good job displaying this. So this is showing different regions and what's predicted to happen with changes in temperature. And so you can see 
in Southern Africa, that they're predicting that uh, there will be an increase in the number of the population at risk as we go forward, if we kind of stay on this course of climate change. And you can also see that this goes out into the 2080s, so really, really far from now. And there's huge, huge confidence intervals around this. So not a lot of certainty within these models. And we see the same sort of trends if we look at Southern Africa in terms of uh, the increase in the transmission season. But again, going out really far and a lot of uncertainty. And you know, if you're like me in a position where I want to say to somebody in charge at a malaria control program, here's the information that can help you make a decision to prepare your program for upcoming malaria transmission seasons. This type of information doesn't have a ton of utility at that level, right? Because it's a huge area of all of Southern Africa, right? That's a lot of different systems, but also there's not a whole lot of certainty and policymakers today aren't making decisions for 2080. You know, so these are really, really useful to be able to predict what potentially could happen. But from a policy perspective, they're not really that helpful for malaria control programs that are already resource constrained and trying to make the best decisions they can for next year. So we've took a little bit of a different angle when we approach this problem, because we know climate change is a long-term process, but what we do know that's happening right now that we can observe and we can measure are natural disasters. So we know that there are increases in natural disasters that are directly linked to climate change two rising temperatures, two changes in precipitation, and we document these. There's an entire Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disaster, right? There's a center, there's surveillance systems, we can track these, and we can give it a number, we can quantify how serious this is. And so they put out um, their numbers every year, just basically showing historically what's been the average and a number of different types of natural disasters and what happened this year, really to track those trends over time, how bad is this getting? Okay, and then we think about natural disasters and what the risks are, right? Um, this is really interesting because it's put out by um, IMF. So they think about disasters in a different way than I think about disasters. So when they say disaster risk, a lot of times they're thinking about uh, economics and monetary risk. Um, but it comes kind of the same way, right? If we think about what's the impact of a natural disaster in different areas of different economies, areas that have lower economies and less resources are going to suffer more from natural disasters than high income countries. And so basically that's what their result was in terms of disaster. And if you think about it, when you have a climate event, when you have a natural disaster and you have a large proportion of your population is vulnerable, either physically vulnerable or because they don't have the appropriate health infrastructure, then you increase that vulnerability and you increase that, that population's exposure to that natural disaster, particularly if there's weak infrastructure. And so they went further and said, okay, well, where in the world are we gonna start seeing changes in natural disasters and what type of changes can we expect. And again, this was using a lot of climate data to model. So there's uncertainty around their estimates. But basically, when you look at it from, they looked at it from tropical cyclone perspective. Where can we expect to see more tropical cyclones? Pretty much globally. We're going to see more tropical cyclones. We're going to see more people impacted. We're going to see uh, more frequent storms, slower moving storms, and storms that have larger impacts. And so this is actually really, really scary when you think about the impacts of a tropical cyclone. And just for reference, um, a tropical cyclone is the same as a hurricane, but just in the Southern Hemisphere. So they're the same pretty much scale of type of uh, severe weather event. And so what actually got me really interested in thinking about this from a malaria perspective, so I was more on the malaria side before I started thinking about climate change and severe storms and stuff, is that I work in Mozambique I've lived in Mozambique. I have a lot of ties to the country and to people there. And in 2019, um, Cyclone Edai hit the coast of Mozambique. So everybody at least tangentially familiar with this cyclone? So it's really interesting because it is the worst cyclone. It's the worst tropical storm to ever 
make an impact in the Southern Hemisphere of all time. You probably didn't hear a whole lot about it because Mozambique's not a country people talk about a whole lot, right? It's not on that radar. So you don't hear about severe storms like this a lot when they hit countries that aren't, you know, in the news a lot. And so it is considered to be the one of the worst cyclones to ever hit in the Southern Hemisphere. It hit in March of 2019. And this was around the same time that I was starting up my first study as like a PI in Mozambique. And this cyclone comes through and, and it hits. And it was really, really scary. Uh, and I'm going to go into why it is considered to be one of the worst ones and what made it that bad. Okay, and so in this article that was published in Nature shortly afterwards, this was in a, within a couple of weeks of the cyclone, um, they gave estimates of the number of people affected and the number of deaths that occurred. And these were just estimates because this was in the first couple of weeks after. Um, if you look these up now, they're still, they've increased. There's been over a thousand deaths and many more people have been estimated to be affected, um, but it's all still with these asterisks because it is still estimates because they never were able to actually get um, accurate counts of how many real deaths occurred due to this storm because of the level of devastation that happened. Um, okay, so why was it so bad? So this is Mozambique. It's on the uh, coast of Southeast Africa. And so for reference down here is Eswatini in South Africa. So it's right down at the tip. And so what happened was in early March, there was a tropical depression. We rarely ever even track tropical depressions. They don't get named, they don't get attention. So if this would have never became one of the most devastating storms, nobody ever would have known that there was a depression that hit the Northern coast. So it hit, nothing really too bad happened. There was a lot of flooding because there was this really slow storm and it was really wide. So it went up through in northern Mozambique and it decided to turn around in Malawi. Went back out to sea, gained a whole bunch of energy, and then turned around at Madagascar where it turned into a severe tropical cyclone and then an intense tropical cyclone. So this is like a really, really, really bad hurricane. And it smashed into the coast into Barra, which is a major port city and the second largest city in the whole country in terms of population, it hit it, it hit that port. Um, there's a ton of river networks in here and it remained a tropical cyclone as it moved through the entirety of the country. So as it went inland, it only slowed down a little bit. And then it traversed into Zimbabwe um, and it eventually kind of petered out into just a regular storm. But across Mozambique, kind of as you go from the coast inland, there's a huge increase in elevation. And at the time that this hit, Mozambique was suffering from a severe drought. So the water tables were very low. And so when you take a whole bunch of water and you run it across the country, up over elevation on very, very dry soil, it all flies down. So you had huge mudslides. And so the winds and the rains and everything and the flooding were huge impacts, but those mudslides is why they don't have accurate counts of how many people were affected because they were never recovered. And it was really devastating because if you look at, you know, how big Mozambique is and the most severely affected is that in dark blue, it's the majority of the population were severely impacted. Okay. And so you have those immediate severe impacts and those impacts lasted a long time. And if you go to Barra, today, you'll still see the destruction from this storm years later. Okay, but when we think about it in terms of, okay, well, what happened to like actual infrastructure? What happened to the healthcare system, right? Because in the aftermath, you really, really need your healthcare systems to be up and functioning as much as, much as they can, right, for response. And so this map is looking at the healthcare access in a normal situation before a giant storm. And you can see kind of bears, oh, Sorry. So Bear is here. So you have cities and you have a big corridor and roads going to cities. So the healthcare access is pretty good. You know, the, the time to get to a health facility is about one or two to three hours. Everywhere in the purple is not so good, over six hours. And the aftermath of the storm, the loss of access here shown in this color palette 
we're seeing that areas that used to have pretty decent access now have increases of over five hours to get to a healthcare facility. And that's mainly because of all of this intense flooding. So the roads just weren't operable. They were all washed out. Bridges that go over these river networks were all washed out. And that's the type of infrastructure that's incredibly difficult to repair immediately afterwards. And so people weren't actually even able to get um, to services that they need. Okay, I'm gonna switch a little bit to talk about malaria, right? So we're gonna move past a little bit from the devastation and onto a different type of devastation. Uh, and so that's mal the malaria situation. So this is Mozambique. Mozambique has the fourth highest number of malaria cases globally. Um, the fourth highest mortality globally due to malaria. And uh, nearly half of the population lies below the poverty line. And that's a poverty index that's internal to Mozambique. So not the global poverty index, so local poverty index. So you have um, a country that is very much uh, uh, limited in its resources. And we know with malaria, it tends to be a disease of poverty. It thrives in impoverished areas. And it also contributes to that, right? Because it infects and impacts the working population, that younger population. You can see from the, this is the incidence in 2019. It's very high pretty much everywhere. Um, but there's, if you look at the parasite prevalence, the, the model parasite prevalence, you can see some heterogeneity, right? In the, in the Southern area, there's moves to, to, to eliminate malaria from that, that region close to the capital. In the central, you have very high seasonal peaks, but malaria is there all year round. And in the northern region, it is really, really high, and it's always there. And so what are the current interventions that are happening across Mozambique, knowing that it is a very resource-limited country? So in the south, where it's lowest, there's indoor residual spraying of household structures with insecticide and universal insecticide-treated net distribution. So anybody who wants a, a bed net can get a bed net. And that's where the, they're really trying to push to get from low transmission to get rid of it. Um, in Zambasia, uh, where they do have fairly high transmission, um, they've done indoor residual spraying. They do have different campaigns there. And ITNs, the nets, are distributed through antenatal care centers. So when somebody's pregnant, they can pick one up um, when they're going for those um, antenatal visits. And they did a pilot-based distribution in school. Okay, to see if they give them the kids, whether or not that helps with the transmission in that very high transmission setting. Okay, so those are two targeted campaigns. Everywhere else has essentially the same interventions available. So the ITN distribution through antenatal cares, malaria case management, and health, health facilities, they have a, a surveillance system to track changes, which is actually really, really good. Um, and everybody uses the same one. And in 2020, I added this in. In Manica province, they did a mass ITN distribution where they distributed um, a million bed nets, which was actually a really cool feat to accomplish because it, they started it right at kind of the height of the pandemic there. And they were able to actually get those bed nets out into communities. And so this is basically where I've been doing my work in Susandanga, which is in Manica province, right along the border. Uh, of Zimbabwe. So it's right in that area where you're seeing sharp, sharp inclines in elevation. Um, and initially we went in to understand kind of what is the community prevalence, what are risk factors, and what are the environmental risk factors, because there is a very diverse environment here. And what is the impact of having essentially in two countries very close together that speak the same language with an open border with two very different malaria policies? What does that look like kind of within those communities? And so we set up a pilot study that was funded through the Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility. We selected our study area, which is in Susandenga Village, which is in Susandenga Ward of Susandenga District. Um, and so we selected it because it has that unique ecology and also it's very accessible from Shimoyu City, which is where most of our supplies had to come from. And it had a rural health center so we could collaborate with individuals within that organization. So one of my PhD students went into Google Earth, digitized all the households. So we had an enumeration structure. 
And then we randomly selected about 100 households that we were going to go visit and do our survey. And we were able to get our survey done right before the pandemic and everything shut down. And we had a questionnaire. We asked about household structure. What was the house was made out of? Were there any um, holes in the walls? Could uh, the windows open and close? Things like that. We were able to get in some questions about damage due to Cyclone and Die because this was still in that aftermath to see what was still there um, and if it was linked to malaria risk in this area. And then individual questions about dem demographics, healthcare access, malaria prevention tools. And uh, we did a rapid diagnostic test for malaria. So we were able to measure uh, the community parasite prevalence. And so when we looked at housing, so these are pictures of the different type of houses and different types of structures of houses that are in the village where we were working. And there's a lot of variability. Uh, so there's more traditional uh, thatch roofs and then more modern kind of uh, tin roofs. There's different uh, material for the walls from unfired uh, mud bricks to cement. And so we wanted to see which kind of different housing types actually were uh, more susceptible to malaria risk and which were actually protective. And so we looked at this and we dichotomized the housing type, the different parts of a house and the different types by whether they're modern or more rudimentary. And so we focused on the type of roof, walls, floors, uh, windows, whether the windows could open or and close, um, and the eaves. And just so the eaves is the part of the house where the roof meets the wall, whether or not that's open or not. And it's left open a lot traditionally because it allows for more airflow, but it's also a great place for mosquitoes to get in. So we wanted to investigate that a little bit. And we did see, particularly on this side, the floor structure, window structure, and the eaves being open um, did have uh, households that had these features had individuals with higher uh, prevalence of malaria in them. But this is that's just looking at a kind of raw data. Okay. When we modeled this and accounting for individual level confounders and all of that, we were able to see um, that we saw really robust associations between the housing structures and odds of malaria infection. And we had pretty good accuracy around these with the exception of the eaves being open or not. So we, and we also um, wanted to test if this association was um, just a mediating association between the actual impact of uh, head of household occupation and uh, education level on malaria. And we actually didn't see much of uh, mediation due to these, the household structure. Even though we did see, you know, occupation and education were associated with the more uh, modern housing structures, um, but we didn't see it kind of going directly through that path. So we know from this that housing structure is really important. And more modern housing is very protected against malaria. And in terms of the cyclone impacts, we asked about housing damage due to the cyclone. And we didn't have a huge sample size, but the majority of households within this region, and this is along the Zimbabwe border, so it's pretty far from that main area of impact, the majority of houses were impacted by the cyclone. So they had somewhere between minor damage and being completely destroyed. Oh, and a quarter of participants said that their insecticide treated net, their primary malaria prevention tool was lost during the cyclone, right? And of all of our participants, three indicated that they received any aid or a new bed net in the aftermath. So the damage that was incurred during the cyclone remained at the time of our survey, which was about a year later. And we saw that particularly households that had significant damage or that were destroyed, forcing people to move into a temporary household or a different house or try to build a new household, experienced a higher prevalence of malaria. So we know that housing is important, right? Housing structure can be protective against malaria. And we know that damage due to severe storms uh, increases malaria risk. And coupling that with kind of climate change, we want to see like, how can we quantify this? This is great in our small survey, but how can we quantify this kind of on a bigger scale? So we started to think, okay, can we use satellite imagery to measure infrastructure damage due to storms? And so 
one of my uh, master's students, I tasked with seeing if this was possible. And so uh, we had the locations of all the health facilities in the country. So we had the geolocation and we knew where they were. And within Google Earth, you can actually have a time slider where you can look at images of the same location at different time points. So we basically looked at health facilities across the central corridor and looked at their most recent image before the cyclone hit, cyclone and die hit, because we knew the exact date that it uh, made impact. And then we looked at the most recent image afterwards. So right after it hit, to see what kind of damage was incurred. And you can see in this picture, it's really, really clear that half of the roof was taken off that building. And then we went forward in time to see how long did it take until that uh, structure was repaired? And was it ever repaired? And so we did have some images where this roof was never repaired. This is still what it looks like. Others where you can see here, the roof on one of the buildings was blown off and then it was given a new roof pretty shortly after. And we did the same thing with educational facilities because those we had got lists of and locations from OpenStreetMaps. And so we looked at those and did basically the same thing. We looked at what was the damage that was incurred and how long did it take until it was repaired. And we were able to map these kind of, what was the distribution of damage to these facilities? And this is going along the main road. So that's why most of the facilities are in that area is because that's where towns are. And so we're able to see, you know, of the health facilities, that most of the destruction happened right at that, um, the main impact point in Barra, but there is damage that we were able to actually document further away that likely was not a high priority for receiving additional aid in the aftermath of those storms. So it was really, really interesting. And we're linking, we're working on linking this to malaria case data to see do we see actual impacts in areas that had more infrastructure damage to health facilities and schools? Do we see higher malaria incidents in that following year? Okay. So then we were working on this stuff and still thinking about climate change. And then this call came out in the spring uh, from Welcome Trust. And it was very specific, right? It was for digital technology development for climate sensitive infectious disease, disease modeling, right? And their whole kind of spiel on this was, okay, we have a bunch of climate models, like the ones that I showed you for malaria, but they're not very useful, right? They're not useful for decision-making. And the models are so complex that if I hand it over to the director of the National Malaria Control Program, they can't really do anything with it and they can't play with it and adjust it and get output that helps them make decisions about where to put ITNs. And so I was like, this is kind of a cool mode where I can see if they'll buy into the severe storm angle and malaria response. And so I put together a team because I am not a software developer. So we put together a team and said, can we do this? You know, can we create this model using historic data? And can we use data that the National Malaria Control Program is generating themselves. Can we use their case surveillance data? And can we use NASA data? Because everybody can get that for free. And luckily my colleagues said, yeah, we can do that. And I said, great, so let's go ahead and do it. And so we put in this call and it was really nice because in their call, they actually talked a lot about kind of the cyclones and severe storms and these impacts of droughts and actually using that to, um, to convey information to policymakers that they can use. So we put this in as uh, digital technology for storm-related malaria response in Mozambique. And so this is a little bit rough because we just launched this, right? But this is basically from our grant where we wanted to create a, uh, a model and a software-based analysis that, uh, uh, platform. So an app essentially that will identify areas of high malaria risk to increase the efficiency of control programs, right? So in the aftermath of a storm, can we predict where the uh, population will be most affected in terms of malaria? And can that be used to then replace people's dead nets? Like pretty simple, right? And so we're gonna use retrospective data. That's the Ministry of Health data. So their data to uh, do a time series model to identify these geographic areas of increased risk. We're gonna develop the software and then we're gonna train 
uh, the malaria control program and the disaster risk management and, and reduction institute to then actually use this so that we're going to kind of do it integratively with them and get feedback on how it's working with them. And so this is just showing all the data, but I want to highlight that we're using their case, malaria case surveillance data. All of the weather data is publicly available. So all of the data on like your tropical cyclones and your tropical storms, every storm that gets a name ends up in this data and the World Meteorological Organization database. Right, so cyclones are specifically defined as storms that have greater than 74 mile an hour winds. Uh, storms are those that are between 39 and 74, but these will say when they happened and where they made impact. But we're gonna supplement this with NASA precipitation data so we can say, okay, how big was that impact and how long did it last, right? Because we know that when a cyclone hits, it doesn't just have a one day impact on the city where it landed, right? It's gonna have a larger impact um, and it's gonna last for a while, right? Storms, these storms of this level last for several days. So can we look at it from a little bit of a different angle? And because we're already grabbing that NASA data to supplement uh, the World Meteorologic Organization data, can we use that too? Because we know that storms with winds under 39 miles per hour still can have large impacts, right? So even though they don't get a name and get to be in a database, they can still have a large impact. So can we actually look at not tropical storms and not these big ones and see what kind of impact they're having on the infrastructure of malaria risk? And we're gonna throw in some census data so we know the population at risk. And we're gonna do a small survey, right? But we're gonna do it nationally. We're going to interview household, heads of households about what the actual damage was done to their house at the last storm that they experienced. And this is really to supplement what is that infrastructure damage and what is the level to actually help that model be more predictive in terms of where houses are actually being impacted and how they're being impacted and what that has on malaria incidents in those areas. And uh, in terms of what we're going to actually do with all this, because creating the models is really fun, but we want to actually be able to have somebody use it. So we're creating this as an integrated database. So that's all the data put together, right? And then we're using that as something that um, we can share with those policymakers so they actually have access to it, and but they don't have to put it together. It's going to automatically update. And it will have the ability to run scenarios. And this is really important for when a storm is being predicted. What if XYZ happens? What's going to be the area that's impacted, right? And they'll be able to actually change those different scenarios to get different results based on how storm uh, trajectories change. And it'll have a, a results database, so everything will be stored. So when they run these different scenarios, those will be stored and they can go back to them later. So they actually can do future planning and then they won't actually have to run this in a day before the storm. So, because they can go back and look at previous results. And I'll have an interactive browsing tool that they can actually have a map with a number of people impacted and be able to deploy interventions. And so for this project, because I'm not, uh, I'm not a computer science, uh, Jai Deep is on the project. Um, and he has a ton of expertise doing this type of thing, which is really, really awesome. Um, Lin Zhang from Biostatistics is working on the modeling part. My colleague, um, Dr. Farrell in Mozambique is going to be doing our surveys and our consulting and making sure that we're doing everything by the rules. Um, and then we're working with the director of the National Malaria Control Program, Dr. Condrino, and Dr. Belem from the uh, Disaster Risk and Response Management System. And then for my Susan Danga project, I have a ton of team members that really, really helped out with that. And it was also run everything on the ground by Dr. Farrell, um, who's been really, really great to work with um, and very integral to, to all this work. So I'm going to stop there because we're right at the time, which is a miracle. <laughs> um, Do you want uh, Lindsay's going to go around with the uh, microphone for people, especially in the floor, and for people online. Yeah. So, do you have any questions? Oh, Audrey. 
I tell you, I was just like, this is like some of my favorite topics, climate cool. change, health. And we've never talked about it in any of our meetings. Yeah. Okay, no. <laughs> Um, so I guess one question. So um, in this data set, I was interested a little bit more about some of the demographic data mm -hmm. you're putting in just be, because I'm wondering how de how detailed it's going to be just because I guess or anytime I think health, I think of um, differential impacts based on age and sex. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if the model, not just the number of people who are the people in mm -hmm. terms of like being even more focused in terms of like right. who you're, you know, you know, bed nets, like pregnant women, kids, yeah, yeah. that type of stuff. So I'm just interested to how detailed. And then I guess because here at um, ISRD, we're always thinking about disaggregating data. When you're getting the census data, how fine is it? Because sometimes those administrative boundaries yeah. still cover large areas. And as you were talking about that, there's a lot of heterogeneity across space. I'm just wondering how detailed. So that's just me being curious. Yeah, those are great questions. And so for the census data, we'll have age, but it's going to be like age category, okay. right? And number of people. And it's all going to be at district level. Okay. Um, and then, and we'll use it as is because um, the, the malaria data is much more coarse, their surveillance system. Is basically when it's age, it's like under five, over five. That's it. Um, and so with using that as our outcome, we can get to just that level in terms of the demographics of the population, which is really important because those under fives, that's who's going, that's who's actually getting seen. When you have that incidence data, they're at the health facility because they're real sick. And so that's really important. And we'll have under five from the underlying population in the census. And so within the model, basically, because we're identifying geographic areas of risk, those ones will pop out just because, just if they have a large young population. And everything is at the district level, which is pretty convenient because the census comes in at district and um, the surveillance data comes in at the district. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. That was awesome. Um, and this model sounds super cool. Um, my question about the model is if you're incorporating the infrastructure pieces at all to get an idea of like if the storm hits particular infrastructure centers or something, if right. how that would impact things. Yeah, so we're, we've put it in for this model. We're going to use the household survey data, which is going to be pretty coarse because we don't have a huge sample size. And we're going to use that essentially to create like a roster file of predicted areas of impact. And that's going to, but that's going to be household. We don't have anything here in terms of the physical like community infrastructure. Um, that is something that I just put in a grant to like put to get that part into that model because from satellite imagery, you can actually see our roads washed out, our bridges washed out. We have shown that you can see if hospitals are destroyed. But for this model, we didn't want to put too much of like pilot work in there, um, even though we know that within that the disaster response system, they now have a database where they track infrastructure damage, but historically they haven't had that. But that's kind of new because they're getting so many storms now that they want to know what's being destroyed so that they can respond to it. Yeah, but ideally we, we want to have that piece in the model. It's just right now the methods for collecting that data aren't as great as something like a census. Thank you, Kelly. This is so interesting. I'm I'm wondering about the pop at the population level, thinking about uh, low income countries. Uh, what are the main causes of death, and how does malaria fit into that? Mm -hmm. And uh, how did the pandemic affect things, including your research? And because that's so disruptive, yeah. international travel. Yeah. So within like Mozambique and, and similar countries, the main causes of death are the Going back to Audrey's question, they're very much skewed towards that under five population. So a lot of it is respiratory diseases and di diarrheal diseases, malaria, um, because there's just that lack of, of health care or adequate health care for individuals of those age groups. So those kind of top up there because of the, the setting. Um, in terms of kind of the pandemic, it's one of those things that I'm still working on. How do we estimate the impact? 
of the pandemic in these areas that don't have that didn't have strong surveillance systems for COVID. I mean, we don't have one, um, and so to expect that of other countries is kind of you know hypocritical. But it was really it's really hard to track the impact of COVID without looking at something like excess death. And even death is hard to measure in a lot of locations. And so it is kind of grappling, like after in 2020, after they had this huge bed net distribution, you saw malaria cases plummet. But that was also at the height of COVID. So was that an actual decrease in malaria or was that that people weren't going to health facilities, right? And so it's hard to tease that apart. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that people weren't going to health facilities for malaria, and so there are increases in severe cases, but in terms of actually having documentation and evidence that you can analyze, it's one of those things that I don't know we'll ever actually have a good answer to, um, which is not very satisfying. But in terms of like how it impacted their research, like the community surveys, those kind of went off a cliff. We had finished up, but the opportunity to like do another one or like expand upon that just was not there because we knew we weren't going to be able to travel and we knew that the team wasn't going to be able to go into people's houses. We were pretty limited on what we could do in a health facility because they weren't letting anybody in. But we were able to get access to the malaria surveillance data. So basically what happened was I just started cold emailing everybody I could that was within any level of the health, like public health area and asking for malaria data. And eventually I kind of like made some inroads and had Zoom meetings with people and was able to get access to health center data. And those are just case data, things like that. And it really ramped up kind of looking at this from an environmental perspective, because that's the data I could get my hands on without traveling. And so it had a huge impact in being able to travel and visit with my colleagues and things like that. But it really like the end result is a large climate change project because that's kind of where my brain reshifted during that time. And I've been able to travel since. So I can go and do, you know, in-person time with everybody. I was wondering about um, your finding that rudimentary housing was associated with more malaria. malaria. Wouldn't you expect that uh, these people would be in rudimentary housing be poorer, worse nutrition, more crowding, maybe worse locations and so on? How do you tease that out? Yeah, so that's why we included that... Um, the head of household occupation status, whether, and we just had that as like full-time or part-time, like seasonal work, and we had education level, so head of household education level. And so that's how we, we actually started looking at it as being a pathway from like head of household education level and occupation impacting the housing and then having that direct impact on malaria risk. But we actually didn't see that, right? We saw the housing malaria risk. We saw education of the head of household impacting malaria risk. So it actually is kind of more of a confounder, which we're able to account for leaving the main impact of uh, housing and malaria risk. So even outside of once you account for those, and those are kind of rudimentary measures, but once we accounted for those kind of economic differences, we still saw the huge impact of housing. And so that's not, I mean, this isn't a new finding that's been out in the literature for a while of the different impacts of types of housing on malaria risk. And it's been trialed, like where people actually build people new houses in different housing styles. And does that have an impact on malaria transmission in communities? Because we know it's a huge risk factor, but it's also a huge protective factor. And so we were going and kind of expecting to see it. But what is different is that you can actually pinpoint which parts of the house are the most impacted, right? Which parts of the house are the most protective against malaria? And those are things, those are having windows that close and putting a floor in, which are also things that you can actually do, right? Like housing or like the roof structure tends to be a little bit of a bear to replace and people like that roofs because they're cooler. And so there is kind of like, what can you actually impact? What can you change? And what's ex uh, acceptable by the community? Because a lot of the more traditional housing types are, more environmentally friendly for the community because they provide a much cooler place to sleep. I don't know if that answered your question or not. <laughs>
Um, one thing I'm thinking about is um, malaria versus COVID. And given that COVID, so malaria vector borne, you want to prevent the vector from going inside. Right. COVID um, airborne or respiratory, you want it as aerated as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm just wondering, is this something that um, if there might, stuff might be inversely related where actually the more rudimentary may actually improve COVID, right. like within house COVID, like reduce COVID transmission risk, um, especially if there's way more aeration. Yeah, so it's, this is just something else where I've just seen where depending on the mode of transmission, mm -hmm. the actual policy recommendations may differ, but it's not that you want people to have rudimentary housing because right. that's so much, but, but I guess I'm just wondering, have you thought of that this or if you start collecting COVID, like do you think that might be like mm -hmm. might, do you hypothesize that you might actually see the opposite relationship that you're seeing yeah. with malaria? I haven't thought about it at all. That would be a really neat thing to add in. Like, did anybody in this household have COVID? Like how many people to see if like having that more like open uh you know, open to the air types of households if they actually reduce like COVID risk because the air is moving. I know it was a really big deal in the hospitals that they told the hospitals in the area to open up the windows. Um, and they're like, everybody's going to get malaria if we open up the windows, especially at night, like they have to be closed. And they're like, you can't have a closed off building with a COVID ward. And so it was kind of that same thing that was a push and pull that they're like, we just can't we can't expose people knowingly expose people to malaria. And so it was, it is kind of that like different way of thinking. Yeah. Even though people prefer to have the windows open because it gets really, really hot. All right. That's all the time we have. Thank Please thank uh, Dr. Searle for her great talk today.